Hey guys, this is Dave Swartz, and welcome to one of my How to Draw Comics videos. Uh, today we're going to be taking a look at page 12 from my new series, Confederate Monster, uh, only available on Patreon. Uh, and we're going to be taking a look at the script to layout, to drawing, to inking, all the way through the whole process. Um, so right now you can see I'm just sort of laying in um, some basic, you know, sketching, some gesture drawing, as we call it. Um, for this page. So uh, what I typically do is uh, when I'm building the different panels, um, you know, I have the fortunate ability to, you know, have a little bit of this planned out because I'm also writing the series. Um, and I tend to write with this, you know, visual, you know, kind of idea. Um, so usually when I get to this stage, I can kind of, you know, draw upon that um, concept that I had previously created when I was writing. Um, but right now, <clears throat> I'm just starting with the, you know, the largest, uh, most important scene in the page. So, you know, when I'm doing a layout, I try to, you know, focus in on, I read the whole thing first, and I try to focus in on what is the most important, you know, thing, the most important panel, the most important moment that I need to, to describe. Um, and I'm going to draw that typically the largest on the panel. And then I'll work everything else around that. So if a moment needs to be really kind of close up or intimate, you know, I might draw that, you know, just so I know, you know, this is taking up this amount of space and, you know, it's done and taken care of. Then I can worry about the, the harder stuff later. Um, so that's why I drew um, in the first panel, I drew that one first really quickly because I already kind of had an idea what I wanted to do there. And it's also based off of the same size of the panel from the previous page. But now I'm putting in the, the main, you know, large panel of this, of this particular page inside um, of the kitchen. Now, um, I, I know that I go ahead and I redraw that second panel because I, you know, I get to the drawing phase of like, this is terrible, <laughs> but it happens. So, um, you know, that's one of the things that I do want to, you know, describe as often as I can. And I'm going to do it again here because I, I hate what I'm drawing and I'm going to redraw. Um, I redraw and I redraw and I change my mind all the time. Um, don't think that, you know, as soon as you lay down an idea that that is locked in, you can always go back and change it. Um, especially if you're not feeling it, if it's not looking right, or if there's something about it that just doesn't look right, fix it. You have the ability to fix it. So um, next, what I'm going to do after I've established that that large, you know, scene um, in the kitchen um, is I'm going to continue to just work through the rest of these panels, um, you know, also paying attention to where I'm going to put the dialogue. Um, so you'll notice in that, that third panel there that I just finished, um, I, I drew in some little circles with a little tail just to kind of describe where I believe most of the dialogue is going to go. Um, it helps me in this stage so that I plan for it early. I can't count how many times I got into a drawing and I realized that, oh man, there's just not enough room in here for this dialogue. What am I going to do? I need to either redraw it or I need to edit the dialogue. And sometimes if you don't have the ability to edit the dialogue, you're kind of screwed. I mean, the only way you can fix it is to redraw it. And when no one wants to do that, right? So again, it's a good idea to just give yourself a little bit of a circle or some kind of square, some kind of space. Um, so you, you have an idea in this early stage um, where that dialogue is going to go. All right, so I'm, I'm almost done with the layout here. Um, I'm putting this last sort of panel together. Honestly, I again, I know I changed this one. Um, I just... I didn't really like how his his face was just sort of flat to camera. Um, oftentimes when you're in this layout stage, you, you really have to like ask yourself, you know, is this too boring? Is this too flat? Um, do I need to, to dial it up a little bit, put a little more drama into it? And that's what I do later on. So I'm putting in the actual frames. I always keep these on a separate layer so that I, you know, just keep them separate from the drawing. Um, a lot of artists will just, you know, keep everything on the same layer. But I mean, to me, it's it's a digital space and I have the ability to, to have multiple layers if I need to, to keep it easier for me later on for editing. So why not just put everything on different layers? So the frames are on a different layer and then I start with um, a vector based um, layer. I'm in, oh, by the way, I'm in Clip Studio Paint is what I'm drawing in here, guys, um, if you didn't recognize it already. Um, and, you know, one of the features of Clip Studio Paint is they have these um, vector layers where you can actually draw and your line becomes um, a vector path. Um, the cool thing about that is you can change the thickness and you can change the brush style um, after you've already drawn. 
So, you know, one of the things I did when I was playing around with this uh, style, the drawing style that I kind of created for the story, um, you know, I, I tried out a bunch of different brush styles. I just did a little drawing and then I went into the vector settings and I just sort of scrolled through a bunch of different brushes and, you know, finally landed on the one that I did, which, you know, has a bit of a grit to it. Um, and I think it, you know, it definitely helps um, add something um, extra horror-y uh, for the story. All right, so um, I just quickly rendered in the ice cubes there, um, but then just, just a second ago, I put in some perspective tools for myself. So um, that's another perk of Clip Studio Paint, if you guys are not familiar with it. Um, you know, they have these fantastic perspective rulers um, that you can set up one point, two point, three point perspective. Um, I use them all the time, and it really does help um, to, to really make your drawing that much you know, more realistic and, and, and tight, I think. Um, and you can get it done just, God, so much, so much faster. Um, and again, I, I understand, I know, you know, I have foresight here that I know I'm going to be redrawing this. So it's, you know, a little bit boring and tedious for me to have to watch it being drawn and know that it's going to be erased here in a minute. Um, but again, that's, that's part of the process. You know, um, sometimes you put a lot of effort in out in man hours into something and it just doesn't turn out and that's okay. Um. I think primarily what went wrong with this particular panel that I'm drawing here is I felt like um, the focus was too much on the space of the room and not on the, the figure and not on the, the emotion that was going on in the character um, or within the character, I should say, um, in this moment. Uh, because Daniel in this moment, he's very angry. Um, he's got a lot of inner turmoil. Um, he feels as though he is a bit torn. Um, you know, he's obviously holding back a lot of who he is. Um, there's a lot of, you know, deception and lies that he has to deal with every day. Um, but on top of that, you know, there's all kinds of other things that he has to, you know, deal with as far as the, you know, living in the South during the Civil War, you know, like he does not agree with slavery. So it's very difficult for him to, to kind of have to go to parties and be friendly with people that, you know, would sooner, you know, lynch a black person than, you know, help them out. So um, anyway, I went into my my Google image search here because, you know, I was drawing this table and I was like, man, I just, I want to get the table a little bit more, you know, accurate. I was trying to kind of create some architecture from my mind and, you know, to me, it just wasn't looking correct. So I, I went on Google and I started trying to pull down some images of, you know, tables that, you know, would have been in a kitchen during the Civil War, um, you know, chairs that they would have used. You know, I'm not trying to, to go crazy with it. You know, I want it to be somewhat, somewhat modest in a way, I guess. I mean, he, Daniel is a doctor after all. So, I mean, he would be rather wealthy. Um, but, you know, I also wanted to show that it's, it's not like a extravagant person. You know, he just wants to sort of live comfortably and almost like kind of fit in because, you know, the character is supposed to be hiding, right? So I wanted him to almost embody, you know, a, a typical, you know, kind of citizen or person, if you will, at that, that time. All right. So, um, again, just trying to put in this, this character to this chair that, you know, and this one thing here that I wanted to point out, um, you know, when I draw a character sitting in a chair, I typically draw draw with the legs up rather than from like the because usually when you draw figures you draw from the head down, um, but when you whenever they're sitting in a chair or you know holding a gun or, or you know whatever, um, if they're interacting with an inanimate object, um, I try to draw whatever is in act, interacting with that object first and then kind of build everything up from there or out from there. Um, so since he's sitting in a chair you know, it would make little sense for me to start with his head because, you know, it may, I may run out of room or I may not have, you know, the, the appropriate amount of width um, or distance, I should say, to, to fit the rest of his body in there comfortably. Um, so to me, starting with the legs and just sort of, bet, you know, putting the legs around the chair first um, and then building the rest of, you know, the body upwards, I thought, um, you know, works out a little bit better than the alternative. All right, and you know that's again one of the other things about layers. You're, you're going to notice me here. Going to go through and almost like erase some of the things behind it. And again, I'm not erasing. Um, you know, the benefit of layers is you can keep everything intact as well as edit things out. So 
what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm separating every bit that I know that I'm going to need to erase some something away from um, on a separate layer. So like the background is on a separate layer, um, the chairs the, on a separate layer, the tables on a separate layer, um, Daniel himself is on a separate layer. Um, and then what I do is I apply layer masks to each of those layers and then I erase the parts out that I, I don't see or that I don't want to see. Um, it may be a little confusing for those who have used layer masks in Photoshop um, because typically with layer masks, they, they work with black and white to add and, and take away. Um, but with Clip Studio Paint, they have this actual, this new little thing at the bottom. It, it looks like a little transparent rectangle. Um, and, and what that is, is that's, that's how you erase out things in a mask. So if you were to try to do that with black or something, it's just not gonna work. Um, black is actually what, you know, removes or reveals things I should say whereas the transparent sort of rectangle area that's below your black and white swatches there in your color um, area um, you know that's what you would use to fill in your your layer mask to make things you know disappear all right so um, you know I'm just sort of checking with some architecture of kitchens um, I'm trying to like spruce this kitchen up a little bit um, because I just felt like it was a little stale oh and there it goes it's gone uh, <laughs> I I just hated it you know like I got I think that's the point like when I started adding in the accoutrement if you will of the room um, I just felt like it was just not exciting I just I, I felt like we were losing the fun detail of the kitchen you know I, I looked at that reference photo and I just thought man like there's so much detail in this kitchen that I'm totally losing because I'm in the um, a boring corner so let's like flip the camera around let's show you know a wall it may be a little flatter given um, but I'm gonna show a, a bigger wall with a lot more you know utensils on the wall shelving yep putting that in there you know um, I can actually show the the door into you know the hallway um, where you know the the next scene or this this next panel is going to take place so not only does it help with the um, detail of the panel to make it more visually interesting. Um, it also connects to the next panel better because it's not just, you know, off panel, you know, you can kind of see the doorway in which it's connected through. Um, but then the, the other thing that I think is most important is it establishes the mood of the, of the scene and, and the emotions of the character a lot better um, than, than in the previous drawing. Okay, so I've got that layout just sort of, you know, loosely put in there. Um, and then again, that's one thing I wanted to mention is I, I do it very loose. It's very gestural. Um, you know, I don't want to spend too much time with the, the, the specific architecture of things as much. Um, but the nice thing about Clip Studio Paint is I can, you know, go in there with perspective tools and I, I don't really have to worry so much about the, the volume of things. Um, or um, you know the the perspective of things because it's all kind of figured out. Um, now there, I will admit that later on when I was doing more complicated pages, more complicated you know anatomy and poses and things, um, I did start to have another layer of detail, another you know layer um, where I go in and I add a little bit more volume and you know information for me to work with when I jump into the ink. Um, and that's, again, the nice thing about digital is, you know, I'm essentially doing penciling and inking at the same time, right? I mean, you you can erase things easily. You don't have to be beholden to the ink line that you're laying down. Um, I just think ultimately it, it, it saves you so much more time. Um, but again, you know, I don't need to, in a lot of circumstances, do a lot of extra drawing between the gesture stage and this final, you know, ink drawing stage. Um, mainly because of all of the awesome tools that digital uh, affords you as an artist. All right, so now I'm going to go back to my trusty Google image search to try to find a cool looking decanter. Um, you know, I, I kind of thought that this one was starting to work, but then the more I looked at it, I was like, boring. I need something more like fancy. You know, like it's just a civil war after all, like everything's a little bit more, a little more fancy. All right, so this is a way cooler decanter. Um, I, I just, it looks 
architecturally more interesting, you know, um, visually, I think it just fits the, the area and I'm trying to fill a little bit better. Um, yeah, pretty cool. Anyway, um, you know, one of the other things that I'm going to be doing as, as we go through is talking about, um, you know, more of the specifics of, you know, how I set this page up, you know, what, why I'm choosing the angles I'm choosing. Um, I'm actually going to switch this over to Photoshop here in a second once this whole page is kind of laid out because I want to, I want to show you guys exactly, you know, why I'm choosing the, 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 the angles that I'm choosing, the the pose of the characters that I'm choosing, right? Because it's, it's all, you know, it's not like I'm just flippantly doing it, right? Um, oh, that looks cool. I'm going to do that. No, I'm, I'm thinking about where I want the reader's eye to go, okay? Um, that's the one thing, the, the major thing about sequential storytelling. You have to always keep in mind where do where I where do I want to direct the eye of the reader? You know, you never want to leave it up to the reader as to where they're gonna go, uh, because I, you know if you're doing it if you're, you're walking into a, a layout like that and you're just sort of going eh like I'm just gonna willy nilly throw down some stuff and, and you know hope that the reader thinks it looks cool right? Well, nine times out of ten I think what happens is it gets boring right? Because there's no path. There's no clear, like, sort of pathway that the reader feels that they can naturally kind of follow. So part of your job as a sequential artist is to direct them in the way, in the way that they, that you want them to go. Um, and honestly, what that, what that should be is it should be a nice sort of, you know, zigzag pattern from left to right that lands them all the way down in the page turn. And again, I'm already getting ahead of myself. So let's jump back into exactly what I'm working on at the moment. And then we can take a look at Photoshop. Okay, I've got that second panel, I think, pretty pretty well laid out. I think it's got a nice amount of detail. I mean, I, I haven't put any blacks yet. I, I typically wait on the darker blacks until, um, you know, I've had a little bit more of the, the page figured out. Um, because it the, when you start to lay down a lot of black, the contrast is the change in contrast is immediate so it's going to affect how you look at not just that one panel but the whole page so that's why i like to wait till the end of all the the basic drawing um, for me to then go back over and start to add in that that rich black for contrast so you notice that i actually put in um, some more detail in my my blue pencil gesture layer um, because I, I didn't have enough in there for my my sketchy drawing um, especially in the structure of the faces um, so i went in and I, I put a little bit of extra structure into the face so that you know when i'm drawing i'm not you know totally off base all right so i'm just going to lay in mr Mr. Veteran Soldier here, who was working for Daniel and his wife during their during their masquerade ball, she is saying good night to him, and he says some pretty off off color things, but she takes it in stride. So, um, you know, one of the things that I wanted to do with this character, um, the the wife of Daniel is I wanted to you know give her almost like a Bride of Frankenstein type um, look for the masquerade ball so that's why she has this like gigantic you know like powdered wig looking thing on it's not just because it's set in the Civil War but um, you know I I just I thought you know we're in this, this masquerade ball we're dealing with Frankenstein you know why not you know give her like this Bride of Frankenstein looking powdered wig which I thought definitely turned out cool. All right, so I'm laying in some additional perspective uh, rulers here for myself so I can get um, this brick laid in here. Um, I don't do all the brick detail. I just do a little bit. Um, and then I believe, yeah, I had to throw in a little edge of that window there because I was looking at it going, oh, we need a, something else over here, just a little something to frame that panel a little bit more because what was happening without that is the eye was just going off the page there's too much heaviness on the right side. So putting a little bit of that same type of thing on the left, it frames it a bit better and your eye doesn't fall off the edge of the panel. All right, so now we are on to the middle panel here uh, where we're just sort of seeing a small 
um, shot of Daniel's wife entering the kitchen. Um, whenever you're doing small shots like this, guys, I always just keep it simple. You know, don't throw a lot of extra detail into it. You know, um, you almost have to think about it in terms of like, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the term atmospheric perspective. Um, atmospheric perspective, for those of you who are not familiar, um, is an effect um, within the field of vision where objects that are far away, they tend to appear lighter um, and have less detail because of the actual atmosphere, the molecules of air uh, and water and other things that are floating around us every single day um, that obstruct our vision. So if anything is super far away or small, you know, just start to chip away at some of the detail and I think it will just make things look a little bit nicer because you know if you start to throw too much detail at things that are super far away it's just going to make them look like they're close up right it's going to screw around with your visual spectrum so I would just you know keep that in mind when you're drawing things that are far away so on to the last panel here um, again I'm pretty sure I changed yeah I'm positive I changed his face here because what I was noticing is when I changed the second panel it became too flat when you compared it to this panel. It's almost like a side profile and then a front shot. So I just figured, you know, if I took his face and I just sort of turned it ever so slightly, you know, I might be able to to just improve the the drama of the scene a little bit. Because right now it feels like he's almost in a in a a fierce kind of attack mode. And I don't really want him there just yet. I kind of wanted more of a sl a snide, um, almost like um he's looking at her without quite turning his head. Um, so we're gonna get to that in a second, but I'm just trying to figure out how the hell to draw this hand. It's one of the things that I struggle with the most, and I'm sure a lot of artists do. Um, you know, just not, in, not only just drawing hands, but like drawing hands, grasping objects, like, my God, I don't know why it is so difficult, but sometimes it's just very difficult to make it look natural. So, um, I think I drew this maybe three or four times before I, I landed on the one that I, I have for the finish. But, um, you know, sometimes hands just, they look too flat. They, they just need a little more dimension to them. So, alrighty. I think it looks like I'm starting to throw in some extra detail. Yeah. Time for some contrast. So, um, sometimes I go all the way back to the beginning, go back to panel one and, and start there. Sometimes I just start where I am. Um, depends on how I feel. Um, but I just at first want to throw in the areas that I just, I know are going to be black. Um, so things like his tie, I know I always make black. Um, his shoes are typically always black. Um, her hair is always, you know, typically black. Um, so I, I just throw that in there first, um, because I want to know what I need to add in order to balance those blacks. Um, again, I want to put in what is most important first, and then I can balance everything else that's lesser, less than important. Yeah. Does that sound right? Less than important? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. All right. So again, you know, just laying in those dark, you know, areas, but trying to maybe add a little bit of extra detail to the background, you know, to, you know, my figures here and there, um, just to, again, give it some more visual texture. Right. Um, one of the things I've learned as I develop my skills as an artist, um, I used to be very afraid of adding a lot of dark blacks, um, lots of extra detail, because to me it just um, it almost was like I was I was too afraid to because I didn't know exactly what to do. Um, but now that I've I've studied more about what to do and how to do it and and how to do it convincingly. Um, you know, I, I, th I think that I'm a lot more confident in what I'm doing and it, it leads to a lot better results. Um, so again, I, I would, if I were you and you're timid about putting in lots of blacks and putting in lots of little details, you know, I would just explore it, you know, have fun with your sketchbook and, and see what comes out. Um, you know, I, I know here, particularly this second panel, you know, I needed to put in those dark, dark, um, areas to make Daniel really come forward. Um, Plus, I, I wanted to make him just look like he's in shadow, you know, like like he feels as though, you know, he's you can see his emotions on the outside. Um, and, and I and I think this panel actually came together pretty well. 
So I, I began with the blacks, the really heavy blacks. And then now what you can see is I'm, I'm drawing in like the little details um, and, and what the, like the little hatch marks. And, you know, what this is, is it, it sort of is like a gray tone uh, between the, the heavy black and the heavy white. Um, it, it, it's not gray, but, you know, the, the little lines, they almost give you the illusion of a gray tone, um, which softens the transition a bit. Um, that's why uh, you see a lot of comic book artists uh, throughout the years. They've always added these little like hatch marks in between their blacks and their whites. Um, it's just a softening tool, honestly. It's it's an old an old inking or an inker or American illustrator kind of you know uh, technique. Okay, so adding more and more of these blacks in here. Um, with the decanter, I wanted to illustrate more of the, the fluidity of, of what the glass is. Um, so it has a little bit more of that, you know, glassy, glossy kind of highlight to it. Um, but it, I also wanted to add just a lot of, you know, dark black detail into it to bring the decanter and Daniel in the same kind of, you know, plane of view. And then if you notice in the background there in the kitchen, I, I sort of added in, you know, a few lines. Um, you know, just to give it some extra, you know, detail because I thought it, it really needed a little bit of extra, you know, lighting to make the room look a bit more um, visually interesting. So that's what I'm doing now is I'm just going through the whole thing and just sort of, you know, touching up any areas that I think need more detail or need correction. So, like I said, here goes the head change. So, um, again, you'll see I went back into my blue layer and I am just putting in a new head so that I can draw it with a bit more confidence in my inking layer. And I think this one turned out a hell of a lot better. Oh yeah, I noticed that his body just looked a little weird. So I had to fix that a little bit first before I went back into my black. So laying in this, this final sort of piece here for the page, um, Daniel I think is looking a lot better. He's looking a lot closer um, to what I expected. Uh, for this scene and for his mood. So, yeah, it's looking a heck of a lot better. He just sort of has that look of disgust and sort of disdain. Um, he is, after all, angry and drunk. So, All right, we're getting pretty close to finishing this page up. I think it's time to save and move over to Photoshop. All right, so we're in Photoshop now, and I've got page 12 opened up here. And what I'm going to do is just walk you guys through exactly why I drew what I drew. Um, to be honest, I could have drawn this in an infinite amount of ways. But with all good art, you want to make sure that you're keeping the experience of the reader or the viewer in mind. Okay? So when someone's reading a comic book, what is the number one thing that they want you want them to do? You want them to turn the page, to keep turning the page to get through the whole book. If you're not subconsciously trying to push the reader into this bottom corner right here, right? They're going to stop or they're going to start at the very top left because that's how we read in the American country. We start from left to right and we zigzag across until we get down to that page turn corner. Now, again, we want to make sure that this is not only the case for this page, but every page that we create. And we also want to keep in mind that we need to follow a path to get there. We can't just go from point A to point B, okay? We have to keep pushing them through. And we need to keep pushing them through to read the appropriate dialogue in the appropriate fashion. So I'm gonna start in this area here, and then we're gonna work our way across this panel. Everything in this panel is about moving side to side, especially I would say moving from left to right. And I say left to right especially because of this negative space. If you really look closely, this negative space, this, this gaping kind of hole compared to this negative space here is again much larger. So visually what it's doing is it's pushing your attention this way. It's acting as a visual sort of you know, um, cushion, if you will to push these two objects that appear as though that they have motion in the direction that you want them to go. If I did it the other way, you know what? Let's just do that. I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna grab this panel 
and we're just going to transform it. I'm going to hold down control, click, and I'm going to flip horizontal. And we're going to hit enter, deselect, and take a look at that. Now, does that make it feel as though you're going this direction? In my opinion, no. In my opinion, it very much makes it look like it's headed in this direction now. Okay, so again, that's why I chose what I chose. So we started here. Oh, let me get rid of that deselect. Started here. Oh, I lost my color. How did that happen? Let's get that color back. All right. So we started here and we move over this way. Now we want to come back over here. Now, how did I get from here to here? The reason is contrast. Okay. If you look at this whole page, what is the one thing your eye goes to the most? And in my opinion, I would say it is this section right here. It's because it's highly contrasted against all the white that you see around it. Typically when you see areas of large black against areas of large white, it creates a lot of visual interest. It, it makes your eyes want to stare at. Um, I put this in here to help balance that out, to help give a bit of a frame to it and keep the viewer's attention right here. And the reason why I want the viewer's attention right here is because this is where I'm going to be putting the dialogue. And that's what I want people to read, right? So let's clean this up. Go back, go back, go back. So my eye starts here, and then it goes over here, and then it comes over to this guy because of the contrast, right? And then it's gonna come over here not just because of this negative space, but also because of his stare, okay? That's another thing that we can do as sequential artists to direct the eye where we want it to go. We can actually use the gaze of a character to subtly push the reader's direction in the natural flow of where we want them to go, okay? So, we have moved from him to this door area here, and then we're going to come down here. And you may be asking yourself, okay, well, why are we coming down here? Uh, well, well, part of it is the fact that I added this little bit in here, which sort of prevented your eye from going off the page completely. Um, if you didn't have this guy here, let's try that out. I'm just gonna paint that, increase my paintbrush here. I'm just gonna paint this out. It almost, to me, feels as though the eye is now falling off the page. It's just going, right? Because it doesn't have anything to keep it on the page, right? So that's why I decided to throw a little bit of a frame in there with this decanter object that's nice and dark that helps to contrast and frame this whole panel. But then it helps to stop the eye and I think in a way, this direction that I did with the arm helps to push the eye towards this panel here, okay? So let's see where this takes us. Well, this guy's looking this way, right? And I would also say that this angle that we see here that's created by the contrast of this dark area is also in a way reinforcing what we just had, but it's also kind of pushing you towards where the dialogue is gonna go next, okay? Because this is where the dialogue, I would imagine, is gonna be placed for this you know, next panel, okay? So let's clean this up a little bit, follow our flow. We're gonna come back and go zigzag up to this guy. And then this guy, right, his dialogue is gonna hit right there. So. We need some things to push us this way. So what is she looking at? Looking at that dialogue again, right? Um, most of his angle here is, I think, helping to push the eye right here, okay? And that's real darn close to that page turn, that, that holy grail of sequential page layout that I think everybody should be shooting for. Okay, so I hope everybody got 
exactly what they're looking for out of this quick comic book drawing tutorial. Um, I'm going to be doing much more of these going forward uh, where we dive more into uh, the construction of a comic book page um, and any other topic uh, that you guys want to, to see me cover. So if there's something that you want uh, to possibly see me do a video on, leave a, a comment down below and we'll see if I can make it happen. Thanks guys for watching.